Hi again, everybody. It's Robin with GFAS just jumping in um, to say welcome. We've had a number of people join us on the teleconference, so I just want to let you know we are going to be starting in just under five minutes. Um, your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with any distractions from background noise, and we get so many people on the phone at the same time. But if you have any questions, if you're having any technical problems, please feel free to type that into the chat box. I'll be happy to help you out. Barbara, I will let you know. Um, no, you don't have to worry about that camera and microphone message. Um, your phones are muted, and, and we shouldn't have the cameras up, so you should be able to just close that message. Um, if we have any people that are on the phone line only because you're having trouble getting onto the Internet portion, please feel free to send me an email to um, robin at sanctuaryfederation.org, and I can help you get signed in once we get um, started with the presentation. But please feel free to stay on the phone line um, while we do that. And I will chime in again in another minute or two as we have more people join the session. Thanks, everybody. Hi and welcome everybody. It's Robin with you guys just jumping in again to welcome those of you that have just joined us on the teleconference. We're going to be starting in just a couple minutes, give everybody a chance to get signed in. Um, as I mentioned before, your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with distraction from background noise when we get so many people on the phone at the same time. But if you have any questions or have any technical problems, please feel free to type that in the chat over on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll be happy to help you out. If you, have, if you happen to be only on the phone line because you're having trouble getting onto the Internet portion, please feel free to send me an email to robin at sanctuaryfederation.org and let me know what the, the issue is that you're having, and I will definitely help you out um, once we get the session started. But please feel free to stay on the phone line and listen while we do that. Um, and as I said, we're going to be starting in just another minute or two. Thanks, everybody. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know we're going to have some more people signing in. Um, and Paula, you should be fine. That message periodically comes up, but it, it's never created an issue. I've got it on my computer sometimes too, so you should be fine with that bandwidth message. Thank you. Um, as we've got more people signing in, um, I just kind of quickly want to go over just some general housekeeping information. Um, because we have got four presenters today who've got a lot of great information, so I want to get hand this over to them quickly. So again, for those of you that have just signed in, 
My name is Robin Mason. I'm with Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. We want to thank you so much for attending the third of the avian webinar series. Um, as I mentioned before, your phone lines are muted. That's only to help with any distraction from background noise when we get a number of people on the phone at the same time. But if you have any technical questions, please feel free to type that into the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. I'll be happy to help you out with that. If you are having issues getting onto the web portion, but you can hear me okay, go ahead and send me an email to robin at sanctuaryfederation.org. Let me know what's happening, and I'll help you out via email to get you signed in. But please feel free to stay on the line and listen while we're doing that. Uh, we are recording this session, and in the next couple of days, we will send a follow-up email with a survey and also a link to view this recording. So if you'd like to review any additional information or if you have other of your members of your team who you think would, be, would benefit from this information, they can definitely feel free to take a look at that. Um, we do appreciate your being here. Again, if you have any technical problems, please feel free to let me know. If you're having trouble hearing, you can type that into the chat also. If you have questions for the presenters during the presentation, please feel free to type those into the chat box also. We will pass those along periodically throughout the presentation or the, the presenter may see it. If we don't get to your question right away, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll definitely make a note of it and pass it along. We should have some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So it is now my pleasure to go ahead and hand this over first to Kelly Heckman, the Executive Director of Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. So you've got it, Kelly. Great. Thank you, Robin. Um, so as you mentioned, I am the, ex oops, the Executive Director of GFAS. Oh, my goodness. Um, a globally recognized sanctuary accreditation body, our mission is to help sanctuaries help animals. And one way that we support this mission is to reduce the causes and underlying issues that may result in animals needing sanctuary. And with this goal in mind, we've supported this three-part series on avian welfare with the focus on the animal shelter environment with several objectives in mind. We want to provide resources and advice for the short term in which you may have a bird in your care. We want to encourage those of you out there that run rescues and begin uh, the accreditation process, which would give you a seal of approval as performing best practices of animal care and operations to your donors, grant makers, and the public at large. Also, we want to develop partnerships between you and the sheltering community and our accredited sanctuaries. And I'll talk about this again uh, at the end of the session, but really you need to start thinking about developing, developing these relationships now before you're responding to a crisis or an emergency situation. Then last, we wanted to ensure that the placement partnerships you are developing beyond our accredited sanctuaries are going to be servicing the bird's needs at large. And again, we'll talk more about that later on in this presentation. But now, briefly, I want to introduce Denise Kelly, president and co-founder of Avian Welfare Coalition, who has 30 years of experience with captive bird care. Denise has been the driving force in creating this webinar series and the complimentary workshop series, which will continue um, with the, our next event at Tufts University on March 28th. So with that, again, brief introduction, I wanna turn it over to Denise. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. I see some people returning, so I'm happy to have you all and some newcomers as well. Um, this webinar on bird placement was probably the most difficult one to manage in this series, not only because of the unique considerations involved to ensure a successful bird placement, but also the many varying approaches to dealing with those issues. And from a personal perspective, I've always found bird placement the most daunting because it's the realization that the decisions that you make are going to impact the quality of life for that bird for years to come. And in the case of longer-lived species, that may even go beyond the initial placement that you make. So from the perspective, of the special challenges, there are plenty. For one thing, birds are captive wildlife. Most people are very familiar with dogs and cats, but are completely unfamiliar with birds. We also have 
to contend with some longstanding misconceptions and myths about the birds themselves Mm -hmm. and to reverse years of outdated care standards, much of which have been promoted to serve the convenience of caretakers than to fulfill the true needs of the birds. And in fact, poor care standards are actually a contributing factor to the problem of birds becoming displaced. Those working on the front lines in avian rescue, animal sheltering, and in the veterinary practice are all too familiar with some of those devastating results. They're also a part of changing the paradigm for captive birds and to help raise the standards not only in the sheltering facilities that we focused on in parts one and two, but also in homes and in all other living situations. We decided to reflect the diversity of those approaches by making this webinar a little bit more informal and by featuring two important voices, one from the avian sanctuary and one from the veterinary community. Both of our presenters are experienced with placing birds under two very different environments, and therefore they're bringing two unique perspectives on placement to this forum. And while each of the topics they'll be covering could probably warrant its own webinar series, and I think everybody would agree, um, we're going to try our best in the time we've allotted to provide some perspectives on facilitating the bird placement process, how it differs from cats and dogs, how to evaluate potential adopters and placement partners, and most importantly, how to educate adopters so in turn they'll have a better and much more realistic understanding of what it takes to be a bird guardian, and hopefully to inspire them to provide the kind of care that will enable the birds in their homes to thrive. Lastly, this session is intended to provide some basic principles and guidelines for the placement of exotic birds. Obviously, there are as many exceptions as the different personalities of the birds themselves. So there is no one-size-fits-all when it comes to birds. And everyone must use their informed discretion to evaluate their individual situation based on the unique conditions and circumstances, always with the top priority being guided by each bird's individual needs. With this in mind, I'd like to um, um, go through the people who have helped make this series. Uh, Special thanks to um, Lorelei Tibbetts and Karen Windsor, our presenters, um, to Kelly Heckman and to Robin, uh, who's been put together this PowerPoint presentation, and thank you very much, Robin. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, Patty Finch for her inspiration and support on this. Of course, to all of our people who contributed photos, and to Dr. Anthony Pilney, who helped with part one of this webinar series. And if you haven't listened to that, please do. Um, Part two was with Lorelei Tibbetts. So we hope with that I am going to turn this over to Kelly Heckman. Thanks, Denise. Um, So before we launch, before I hand it over to the speakers, I want to kind of step back and think more broadly about the needs of birds and really all captive animals. So you probably have come across the five freedoms in your work with companion animals. They're the principles by which all animals should have in captivity, not only in shelters, but anywhere, zoos, farms, and even our homes. So with it, they include freedom from hunger, thirst or malnutrition, disease, injury, freedom from physical or uh, thermal discomfort, fear, distress, or other negative psychological states, and ensure that they carry out normal behave- normal forms of behavior, which for birds includes flight and social bonding, among many other things. So for us, it is important to think about the unique needs of birds and what needs to be done in order to guarantee they receive the five freedoms. 
So you should look into to ensure that the birds that come into your care receive a lifetime of care that follow these five rules. And using that as a guideline, um, you know, the first two parts of the series, we gave you some insight into um, you know, providing for the nutritional requirements, keeping the environments free of disease, keeping, um, giving them appropriate space. But today, as Denise uh, mentioned, we're going to be discussing the prospects of birds finding new homes after they've left your facilities. So either through adoption or potentially uh, placement partners. So how can we ensure that the five freedoms are maintained at your facilities, but also after they've left? So you'll need to assess the animal. Um, and this is kind of an overview of what's going to happen today. Over, uh, assess the animal. So are they adoptable? Should they go to a sanctuary? How do you choose adopters? And what would be the ideal setting for this unique bird? Uh, education for the potential adopters of the unique needs of birds at large and maybe for that individual animal and what they can do, what you can do to support those needs and help them support those needs. And then again, developing placement partnerships. So do the partners that you develop share your desire to give birds those five freedoms? So for some of you, um, this is maybe the first time you've really been thinking about uh, avian adoption. Um, and you don't currently have an avian adoption program per se. So if you're interested in moving in that direction, you'll need to go through the exercise of generating an applicant screening process, organizing home checks, ensuring potential adopter has no plans of breeding, which uh, would only contribute to this issue of homeless birds setting up a system of ongoing support, and of course, pulling the necessary contracts together to make it all legal. And a lot of this you might have in your arsenal, given your work with dogs and cats, but again, it's worth considering the unique needs of birds. So to discuss these issues that shelter faces in finding placement for birds, we have two excellent speakers for you today, as Denise mentioned. First, we have Karen Windsor, who is the executive director of a GFAST accredited sanctuary, Foster Parrots, in Rhode Island. She and her husband, Mark Johnson, launched Foster Parrots, which has become a premier avian rescue and sanctuary, and also serves to educate the community about avian issues and building collaborative relationships to support avian welfare. And so I really appreciate Karen for coming uh, and helping give this presentation today. We also have Lorelai Tibbet who is the practice manager at New York City's only exotic pet hospital, the Center for Avian and Exotic Medicine. And if you've been following the series, you know that Lorelai was a speaker for our second webinar. And we are just thrilled that she could return and give us more insight in, um, from her experience. So with that, I will let uh, Lorelai take it. I, I believe Lorelai is going to launch this to start a discussion about how birds require unique placement considerations. I am. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to, to start by saying um, this is, I'm so happy that so many of you are, are watching this and listening to this because as working, someone who works in veterinary medicine, you know, we, we work with so many birds and you wouldn't think that it may be something I would be terribly experienced in, but if I could tell you how many times a week I get emails from people, clients, non-clients, um, almost on a daily basis from people who are looking to either find homes for their birds, um, find permanent sanctuary, rehome for all the myriad of reasons we're going to talk about. You know, it's really mind boggling. It was something I didn't expect when I first started getting into veterinary medicine. I didn't really think I would be part of a huge network of adoption um, for birds and for other exotic animals too. So, um, you know, it's been, it's a great joy to do it. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it, but um, more importantly, it's, it's kind of mandatory. It's something that I think anybody who's in veterinary medicine, if any of you out there are, um, should really be educated about and involved in. So, moving on, um, we're going to talk a lot about some of the unique placement considerations of birds, and they really are unique in that it, it, they're very different from dogs and cats. These birds are not they're not captive animals or, or perhaps shouldn't be captive animals in that they have so many intact natural behaviors um, carried over from 
their innate um, instincts from being wild. I think a lot of people are starting to be aware of the noise issue. And, you know, people come to me all the time, well, I'm not interested in getting a bird. Is there one that's not so loud or that's not noisy? And the answer is no. Um, I, you know, I remember my first time in Costa Rica um, being woken up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning before the sun is up um, by the, you know, screaming calls and flocking and um, foraging of the parrots. And it's amazing to hear it. It's, it's what they're supposed to do. So, you know, some species maybe aren't quite as loud as others, but the bottom line is um, anyone who's looking to adopt a bird has to be prepared for a lot of noise. Mess and destruction is another major problem for birds. Um, they, as much as they are caged animals, they throw things out of their cage. They poop um, instead of once or twice a day, like a dog or a cat, I don't know, 20, 30 times a day, depending on the, the kind of bird. They release a lot of feather dander, um, not just feathers, but dander that creates, um, depending on this kind of bird, an enormous amount of mess in the home. I think they're going to do something very different than dogs and cats as well. And we're going to talk a little more about that, but a lot of birds um, bite out of just normal uh, fear response, and uh, that can be interpreted as something that a negative, whereas it's really just actual a normal part of what they do. And then bonding preferences. Some birds just either don't prefer to be bonded with people, they're bonded to other birds, or they are um, not acclimated or used to being with people. And sometimes it's something different. They only like, you know, women with blonde hair or men with mustaches. It's very particular, and, and that's a very strange and unique, unique issue for birds. Um, feather destruction and self-mutilation is a major problem for certain species in particular. And, it's hard because a lot of people desire to have birds as pets because they're so incredibly beautiful. Um, and then when something happens, like this adorable African gray on the right image here, for those of you who can see it, um, a lot of them, once they're in captivity, start doing things like pulling their feathers out or even hurting themselves and damaging their skin. So this can be very undesirable for birds. Um, and as far as male and female, this is a, a, a very interesting fact that most birds are not sexually dimorphic to the human eye, meaning we can't tell in most species which one's male or female. And that can make it very difficult when you're talking about placement considerations. <clears throat> Somebody just posted a little comment here that I thought I'd, I'd mention about there are quiet birds in need of homes, domestic pigeons, especially in doves or close seconds. Um, and that they don't bite. You know, I, I would only disagree in that I think doves can be very noisy and they have kind of a constant cooing noises and things that, that I've had clients become very quite annoyed by and not, and not want. Um, and they do bite as well. I just would be really careful when adopting these birds out. Um, they're all different. I've been bitten in, in, by many pigeons and certainly it's not as bad as a macaw bite, but it can happen. So just be careful when you're when you're um, describing birds' behavior to, to potential adopters, we want to be honest about you know what may, what they can or can't expect. Um, so temperament and adoptability, absolutely, they cannot be evaluated on the same scale as dogs and cats. Um, as I mentioned in a previous slide, it can be very normal for them to become what we would consider aggressive, lunging beak open, attacking. Um, some birds even will fly if they're able to to um, what looks like harm a person, but really it's a part of their natural defensive behavior and this is a normal part of how they react. Um, it's not something they've been bred to do, such as you know certain dog species that might have been you know bred to be aggressive for, for various reasons. Um, and they respond really differently when they're uh, in a shelter setting and with different caretakers. They might really find certain, uh, they might react to certain people differently. They might find some people, tall people might be more threatening to them and they might be more fearful and aggressive. Um, like I mentioned, different sexes, male or female to birds can for whatever reason be intimidating to them or preferable to them. And then there's seasonal behavior changes. Many, many times birds will be different depending on their reproductive uh, seasonal state. Certain times of the year, uh, birds will become really kind of almost crazed hormonally. They're looking to be more um, <clears throat> make a family, make babies, and they might be uh, more 
cage protective or territorial. So there's a lot of things to consider depending on, you know, the time of year that you're looking to place these birds. So staying and neutering is very tricky. Um, we, doing these surgeries is something that we really only do on a um, really medically required basis. It's very complicated, very difficult, both staying and neutering of birds. And we really wouldn't do it preventatively. Unfortunately, medicine hasn't advanced to that uh, state yet. And unintentional breeding is a bad consequence of this. You know, you get these cute little lovebirds in and they are, you know, happy to be in pairs, males and females, and happy to make many, many babies. So that can be really frustrating because it just propagates the problem of um, uh, too many birds in the pet trade. So really important is screening out breeders. Uh, a lot, I think a lot of people think that they think it's fun or beautiful and the miracle of life, and there really isn't much cuter than a baby parrot, but our responsibility really needs to, to be with people who are not looking to create more unwanted birds or birds that are difficult to place, um, especially with these larger parrots. Uh, there's, there's really no reason uh, for us to be trying to make the problem worse. One of the things that I used to say uh, to people is, oh, we're looking to find our forever home for these birds. And over the years, I've kind of stopped saying that because it's really not accurate. Um, whether depending on the age of the bird and the species of the bird, but there are instances where people just can't care for the birds anymore, whether it's they become indigent or elderly. Um, people have changes in their lifestyle where they maybe can no longer care for birds. So it's important to take all of these things into, into account when you're looking to adopt out these birds. Uh, they have really long lifespans, some of them. They have these really complicated social needs. So we don't want to set people up for necessarily thinking, oh, this bird's going to be in your home forever. We should be setting them up for as long as you possibly can and prepare for what happens at the next stage. And, um, and I think Karen's going to be talking a bit about that later on as well. And then uh, as far as veterinary care, this is something I, of course, talk about with clients all the time because there's nothing more frustrating than when I adopt a pet out to a client and then six months or a year later, they come back and their pet has a problem, an illness or, or trauma or whatever, and they don't have the money to care for the, the, the pet at that point. So I think it's really important to address this. We shouldn't really be adopting pets to people who can't afford veterinary care. It's very basic needs that these animals need to have. You know, pets are a luxury, in my opinion. I don't think that people who can't afford proper medical care should have them, and I have no problem telling people that. And uh, I think as far as veterinary care for birds, it, it, should be, it should be mandatory. And yes, it is expensive. Avian specialists are just that specialists. They've gone out of their way to um, dedicate their lives and their, uh, their professions to, the, to birds, and, it, and it, it can certainly cost more to pay for that kind of an expertise. <clears throat> Somebody just mentioned veterinary care is experimental at times and, and can be hard to find. Yeah, depending on where you live, that can be really frustrating. Um, if there aren't any specialists nearby, um, we can talk about it later. I think I have another opportunity to discuss different ways of finding avian vets that are maybe not specialists, but savvy in, in veterinary medicine for birds. And, and that can be frustrating if, if there isn't someone near you for sure. So trying to decide whether a bird is ready to go to a home or should be in a kind of permanent sanctuary can be a tough call especially for shelter workers um, who maybe aren't that familiar with, with birds. You have to try really hard to get to know birds' body language and try to understand what they're telling you. There are some birds that are really gregarious and they love people. They want to sit on your shoulder. They want to communicate with you um, by you know, whether it's just eye contact and talking and verbalizing, or physically, they might actually be hand-tamed and want to actually be bonded to people. And sometimes this is very obvious, sometimes sometimes not. Um, there are some birds who are the complete opposite. Uh, they're just terrified of people. You walk in the room and they back up. They're hiding behind things in their enclosures, just really, really terrified. And 
it may not mean that these birds have been abused. It may not mean that they've, that they've been, you know, injured or, or have had trauma with people. It might just be their personality. Maybe they just, maybe they came from a situation where they were only with other birds. And then the question is, are they adoptable? Should birds like that go to a home with people? Um, and that really just depends on the situation. It depends on the potential adopters and whether or not they're going to be able to handle that kind of a situation and provide the proper social needs for these birds under those conditions. And we're definitely going to touch on that more later. It's really important to allow the birds to, to decide for themselves. I think a lot of times in a, in a shelter situation, these birds are it's going to be kind of obvious whether or not they're willing to and happy to socialize with people or if they're just going to be happier being with other of their own species. And I think one of the things you have to be really careful about is not forcing them uh, in a situation they're not comfortable with. You know, conversely, a bird might not be comfortable being with another bird. They, maybe they've never seen another bird before and don't want to be with another bird. So it's important to recognize what the bird wants. And then, of course, you're going to come across birds that have serious behavioral or medical issues, you know, particularly, like I mentioned before, they might have um, feather destructive behavior or self-mutilation problems. And these might not be something that a typical new bird owner is able to handle. And you really need to identify your resources. And of course, you know, veterinary resources are, are great. Uh, we have a lot of clients who are more comfortable with birds that might have um, you know, different behavioral or medical conditions and are, have, might more, have more experience handling them. Um, shelters and places, uh, sanctuaries also might have more resources for kind of bird savvy uh, potential adopters and, and having those resources are going to be very important. Um, somebody just posted a, a quick question about what defines a bird as being quote exotic. For, for us in the veterinary field, we treat, you know, the name of our practice is a center for avian and exotic medicine. And basically, it's any um, pet, because we don't really treat wildlife where I am, but pet that is not a dog or a cat. Um, they're considered exotic if they're not traditional domestic species. So with that, uh, the next slide, we're going to move on. And um, Karen's going to take over for a little bit and bounce back and forth. Okay. Well, you know, now we've got birds in the shelter situation and we've got to now figure out how to get them out, hopefully. Uh, the adoption evaluation process is particularly important in regards to parrots because the care requirements for parrots are so complex and are not necessarily well understood by the average adoption applicant. To the greatest extent possible, we are trying to break that cycle of perpetual rehoming that so many parrots experience. Through the adopter evaluation process, we hope to decrease instances where we're placing parrots in exactly the same kinds of situations they're coming from. Some of the questions we need to ask are, what are the applicants' motivations or expectations? Are they realistic? Are they in the best interest of the parrot? What is the experience level of the adopter and what species of parrot is likely to be a good fit? To what extent does the applicant have the ability to meet the needs of a parrot? Do they have the time? Do they have the money? In short, the evaluation process is the tool we use to gauge the, strength, the strengths and weaknesses of an adoption applicant, determine how much support the applicant is going to need, and weed out poorly suited applicants. Prior parrot care experience is definitely not always necessary. In fact, so much of the information about parrot care that's been disseminated over the last two to three decades has been proven to actually be harmful to parrots. We'd rather have someone tell us that they have no experience but are willing to learn and are open to guidance. The parrot will teach the guardian about parrots. What is most valuable in an adoption applicant is compassion, empathy, commitment, and willingness to learn. Denise, um, did you I have a comment about this photo? Yes, I did uh, have a comment. Um, just as an example, um, the bird in this picture uh, was actually a bird who uh, lived in a basement for 30 years without the company of another bird and was never handled. Um, that was his second home, so it's likely that this bird, Cece, is a lot older than 30. 
Um, when the adopter took the bird to the vet, when she first got the bird, he was nearly on death's door, huddled on the cage floor, unable to perch, and could barely breathe. The vet diagnosed that this bird had heart problems, parasites, and a respiratory infection. Obviously, the bird hadn't been seen by a vet in years or possibly had never been to one. This photo was taken six months later. And as you can see, this transformation of this bird was is just amazing. Um, I've met him, and he is just wonderful. And it's a classic example of when you find the right dedicated adopter. You, it does happen, and the resilience of a bird that has lived like that to adapt to a new life. So I just hope this provides a little inspiration for people to say, well, you know, if the bird is really seems unadoptable, well, it really can turn around for them with the right adopter. Next. Okay, it's Lorelai. Lorelai, again. you're back on. <laughs> so, continuing this evaluating potential placements topic, um, social support not being optional, it's essential. It can't, can't be overstated. Um, when I'm interviewing potential adopters, I talk to them at length about well, what's, your, what's their home situation like? How often are they home? What are their work schedules like? You know, I, I, want a, I want an idea of how, you know, how much attention and how much interaction they're going to be able to have with these birds because, you know, birds really should not be alone in a cage all day long. It's, it's, it's quite cruel. They certainly should have companionship with other birds. You know, it's funny, over the summer, last summer, we had a, um, a veterinary student studying with us from Sweden. And she said that in Sweden, they have a law that you actually cannot purchase exotic animals singly. They will only, by law, sell two, a pair at a time, not just birds, guinea pigs, ham well, maybe not hamsters because they eat each other, but other animals as well. I thought that was really amazing. They're recognizing the need of these animals to have companionship. They are flocking birds. Um, we mentioned here parakeets, cockatiels, canaries, finches, lovebirds, but really all birds um, live in some sort of a social network in the wild, um, and they really should be should not be adopted out as single pets. Um, homes in which parrots of any species will spend all or most of the day alone represent a poor placement situation. I mean that's really as basic as it gets. If if the bird is going to be alone. It, this just isn't going to be a, a good place um, for that bird. And I, and I really think it's important that you guys are, are well in tune with that, um, with, for birds in particular. Regarding health and wellness, of course, the ability to provide a species-specific nutritional needs is very, very important. Uh, we are going to talk about diet later on, but it's, it, it's, it's well beyond just filling a, seed, a, a bowl of seeds. I think that's very outdated, old-fashioned, we don't just, you know, dump a, a dump seed in a dish and give it to birds anymore, and we're going to talk about that later. And as I mentioned before, access to and the ability to afford veterinary care, um, somebody posted a question asking, she, she says, a, or he says an annual exam for a dog seems to run between two and three hundred dollars, depending on vaccines, testing, or et cetera. How much is a typical bird exam? Because I think um, you know, I did mention it can be very expensive. Well, the good news about bird exams is the most important thing to do is have them examined. So it's really just the cost of the exam, um, which depending on where you live can be anywhere probably from 35 or 40 dollars up to we charge 115 in New York City where we practice. Um, we don't do vaccines for birds. We don't do, you know, usually flea and tick prevention and things like that. So there, you know, yeah, we do often recommend testing, um, not maybe on an annual basis, but every few years to ensure the overall health of, of the pets. So the actual yearly cost of bringing your bird to the vet isn't that high compared to dogs and cats. But when they get sick, Yes, it can be very expensive. We need a lot of specialized equipment and a lot of specialized training in order to be able to work with these animals. So that's when it can be a little bit, um, you know, cost prohibitive, I think, for some people. 
regarding you know how to find veterinary care for birds, I think a great resource for people who um, don't have don't know or or aren't aware of of veterinary of bird savvy veterinarians would be to go to number one the ABVP, which is the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners website. They are the governing board for board certified vets. Um, and then there's the AAV, which is the Association of Avian Veterinarians. These are not board certified vets necessarily, but they are veterinarians who have a very special interest in birds. They usually, they're, they're a member of this organization, so they are going to continuing education and they've taken it upon themselves to be part of a group that's more interested in birds. So this would also be a good opportunity for people to find a maybe bird savvy vet that's not certified if there isn't a board certified vet in area. Um, somebody mentioned here on the comments section the initial to get baseline value to make a difference in diagnosing when something goes wrong. I think what she's talking about, and I couldn't agree more, would be the um, first time you ever bring your bird to a vet. We like to we like to call it a post-purchase or post-adoption exam. We very often will recommend post-purchase testing for infectious disease to get a baseline of what's going on. Cost for something like that. Again, I'm in New York City. Things probably cost a bit more here. That can certainly be anywhere um, outside of the $100 exam fee. It could be anywhere from $200 dollars for post-purchase or post-adoption testing just to give you guys a basic idea. Um, and the two links I mentioned that somebody's asking were aav.org, that's the Association of Avian Veterinarians, and the other is ABVP, the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. Um, and those are great resources for locations of, of avian vets around the country and actually internationally. Um, so, when you have an application, when you're, you know, trying to find good homes for these birds, there are some things that you can ask to help kind of let them know and find out if they have any potential dangers in the home. And it's important that you guys all understand what a lot of those risks and dangers are. So here's a, here's some um, potentially dangerous predatory animals, uh, dogs, cats, any of these animals that like to eat birds certainly could be dangerous. Not all of them are and it can be a little bit tricky here because some dogs and cats actually live very well in homes with parrots and birds uh, but this is something that needs to be addressed and you need to figure this out before placing a bird in a, in a potentially dangerous environment. Um, Teflon and other non-stick surfaces that are coated you know with the PTFEs they're, when they get overheated, they emit this um, very highly toxic fume that kills birds. This is not a myth. I have seen this in practice many times over the years, unfortunately. And I think it's something to just emphasize again and again. It, it's, not, it's not any kind of nonstick pan that you accidentally leave in the oven or burn something on the stove can kill your birds. So be very, very careful about that. Self-cleaning ovens and silicon oven mats as well can uh, be very dangerous because of those same kinds of fumes that are emitted. Uh, <clears throat> tobacco smoke, meaning if people are smoking, whatever it is, pipes or cigarettes at home, paint fumes, particularly oil-based paint and burning wood. Um, somebody mentioned the burning wood example in their comment section here. If you have a wood burning stove, a fireplace, anything that releases um, smoke basically potentially in your home could be really, really dangerous. And depending on the kind of wood you're burning too, I, I'm not real familiar with, I've seen it, I don't have a, a fireplace here, but I've seen in the stores, they sell those starter logs. There's all kinds of chemicals put on those. I don't know what that releases when you burn them in the home. So just be really careful mm -hmm. about that. Um, Somebody wants, to wants me to mention it's not always when things get overheated. Um, so she knew someone who lost a, a Gotham cockatoo to a bread maker with nonstick coating. That's really scary. Um, I, I've always been under the impression it was when it was overheated. Maybe the bread baker was on for a very extended period amount of time. I don't know, or, or, or who knows, but that's really tragic. So yeah, my recommendation to people regardless is just don't use it. 
Uh, there's a lot of other wonderful products out there other than nonstick cookware to, to cook with. There's really no need for any of that. And then an um, escape path, uh, direct access to the outdoors, windows without screens. These are all really bad ideas. If you, uh, if there's a chance that your, uh, if your bird is out and flying around the home, which hopefully they are trying to get exercise, you have screens on your windows, screens on your doors, and uh, there is no way that they could potentially get lost outside. Similar to other animals, uh, plug-in air fresheners and scented candles can be uh, dangerous, but for birds it's just a little bit worse because they have really, really sensitive um, respiratory tracts and a whole system of air sacs that makes airborne toxins much more dangerous to them. So anytime you're using these air fresheners, scented candles, uh, anything that can release toxins, you're going to really put your bird at risk. And this is something that all potential bird owners that, you know, at your shelters, you just need a list of things that they shouldn't have in their homes. And when you're, again, this, this is meant for when you're having your application process, these are the questions that you should ask so that you can have a conversation with them about it. And try to get a feel. Are they the kind of people who, no matter what you say, they're going to smoke at home with the bird? Um, they're, they're not willing to give up their nonstick cookware. That's fine. They can have that lifestyle, but they shouldn't have a bird. They should potentially consider adopting another kind of an, an animal. There's certainly another, a lot of other um, um, dangers in the home, and we are going to touch base on those later on in the talk. So, so get ready. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to scare, scare these people even more, all the potential dangers. Mm -hmm. um, I would also like to mention that we do offer an, um, an avian adoption package on our website, um, which includes an evaluation form and application at um, avianwelfare.org backslash shelters. Okay. Okay, we're going to talk about long-term care. It's important that any potential parrot guardian understands what the term long-lived means. In terms of parrot guardianship, we are talking about an animal who, if well cared for, will almost inevitably outlive its guardian's ability to continue care. If you're a young 30-year-old person who adopts a 5-year-old Amazon, 50 years down the road, you're going to be at the end of your life and your ability to care for a parrot. But your Amazon's got several decades of life left. It's not uncommon for Amazons to live well past their 60s and 70s. Same holds true for other larger parrot species like macaws. Even healthy, well-cared-for cockatiels should be living into their mid-30s. Consequently, when a parrot is adopted into a family, it's going to take several generations of people in the same family to care for the parrot throughout its life. So oh, parrots, they're messy, they're loud, they're destructive, territorial, aggressive, demanding. Despite all of these issues, the most typical reasons we hear for parrot relinquishment are not so much about bird behavior as they are about the changes and events in people's lives. Divorce, marriage, birth of a baby, children growing up and moving away, residential problems like apartment restrictions, residential moves or loss of a residence. Uh, health issues are huge, and many of these are directly related to the presence of the bird in the home. Allergies are not uncommon, and serious lung issues like COPD, asthma, or birder's lung are all too common. And of course, just like we talked about, many parrots lose their homes when their guardians grow too old to continue care or they die. It's important that an adoption applicant seriously thinks through the variety of potential life changes or events that may impact their ability or willingness to continue caring for a parrot. Estate planning is important to ensure the continued care of any animal beyond our own life. In the case of a parrot with a potential lifespan of 30, 50, or 80 years, this is most critical. Furthermore, there are fewer people or agencies equipped to assume the care of a parrot, so pre-planning is essential. Adopters must be informed that this is not only a part of the reality of parrot guardianship, but also a part of the expense of parrot guardianship. Many people assume, and this is my favorite, many people assume that their children will step up and take over the care of their parrot. Well, guess what? The children have grown up witnessing the level of commitment required to keep a parrot. They don't want the parrot. Steps that need to be taken 
in the estate planning process include designating, designating a guardian or several willing guardians, and the operative word here is willing. And because humans can be unreliable, it's a good idea to make sure there's a backup plan. Alternatively, um, many people prefer the security and permanence of a sanctuary for the bird's retirement. If that is the case, it's critically important that people visit any facility where they are considering placing their bird and are comfortable with the arrangements and quality of care that will be delivered. If possible, financial considerations should be included in one's estate planning. In the event that a sanctuary has been chosen, a financial arrangement will be expected and it can be high. Estate planning for one's parrot or any kind of pet should be pursued with the assistance of an attorney or a formal will or pet trust. Laws surrounding pet trust and financial settlements for pets vary from state to state, so it's advisable to research the facts and plan accordingly. Lastly, it is important to make sure that friends and family all know exactly what arrangements have been made for the parrot and that they can easily access contact information for whomever will assume care for the bird. The, um, you know, the concept of estate planning should be discussed with, with any potential parrot adopter or really adopters of any animal. It would be a good idea to include estate planning information and guides in every adoption packet for birds, for dogs, for cats. There's nothing sadder than an animal that is left behind when it's being died. Okay, uh, utilizing foster homes. Um, you know, any parrot entering an unfamiliar shelter situation is going to be pretty freaked out, but some parrots are better equipped to settle in and go with the flow than others. A shelter needs to be able to evaluate the individual needs of each parrot coming into the system, as well as its own ability to meet those needs. Having access to a foster home situation for certain parrots who might need a more quiet setting or specialized care can be a good thing. An interim foster home situation might be appropriate for a parrot if a shelter lacks space or quarantine accommodations for parrots. Phobic or nervous parrots, parrots requiring medical attention or socialization training may all benefit from a foster home situation. Oh, God, you know, there are so many unique challenges surrounding finding good quality placement situations for parrots. As shelter professionals, it is our job not just to get animals out of our facilities, but also to make sure we are placing them into good homes with informed adopters. Our role as educators and advocates for the birds and animals we place is one of our most important functions. In order to properly educate, we ourselves need to be educated, and we need to pass on what we know. Um, you know, as, as we work to place parrots and properly educate adopters, one of the biggest challenges we face is to dispel so many widely accepted myths and misconceptions about parrot care and effectively raise the bar in regards to standards of care for parrots kept as pets. It's important to recognize that many pet industry standards were established solely for the purpose of marketing and selling the birds and were designed to appeal to consumers, not to benefit the parrots. Over the last 20 to 30 years, we've learned a lot about the true social and psychological nature of parrots. As shelters, rescue organizations, and veterinarians, our fundamental responsibility is to the well-being and welfare of the animals we care for. Therefore, we have the responsibility and the obligation to educate bird placement partners, clients, and adopters. A tiger born in captivity is no less wild than a tiger born in the jungle. Everybody knows this, but we don't seem to understand the correlation when it applies to parrots who are, in every respect, wild animals. It's when we take this wild animal and try to squeeze it into a domestic mold that we end up disappointed in the animal who cannot possibly fulfill our ex expectations and we set ourselves up for adoption failure. We do not advocate keeping wild animals as pets, but the reality is, is that people are going to continue to keep parrots. 
If this is the case, then we need to learn to embrace the wild and not only anticipate and accommodate natural wild behaviors, but also value them as the unique attributes of the extraordinary animal who we are privileged to have in our lives. Huh. Myth. Oh, I, the myth alert. Mm -hmm. Parrots should be purchased or adopted as single pets in order to ensure the bond between the parrot and the human. <laughs> Uh, it's really difficult to decide which parrot care myth has actually been the most harmful to parrots, but the single parrot alone in a cage standard is certainly right up there with the top most destructive standards in aviculture. Parrots are social animals and are wired to be connected on the same level as elephants, dolphins, and primates, including humans. They are capable of feeling profound loneliness and they are subject to the psychological trauma as a result of chronic social isolation. When a parrot is adopted into a human home, that family must be prepared to be the flock and to fulfill that parrot socially and in a meaningful way every single day. If a human family cannot be present for a greater part of each day, then parrots should be adopted in pairs or small groups. Social support is, is not optional, it is essential. Parrots who are well socialized with humans can love their avian partners as well as their human guardians and will thrive with the attention of both. One of the leading causes of adoption failure is the lack of adequate social support. This results in parrots who act out and guardians who are unable to handle the guilt of the loneliness they have imposed upon their bird. I you know I can't tell you how many times when I have asked an adoption applicant how much one-on-one -on -one time they will be able to give their parrot, they proudly say, "My parrot will get one hour of attention every single day." Um, it's wow. If someone were to walk into a shelter to adopt a dog and they told the shelter manager that they intended to provide the dog with one full hour of out-of-crate time every single day that person would never be allowed to adopt a dog. It is unclear why anyone would think this would be an acceptable way to keep a parrot. Parrots are territorial by nature and they can certainly love their cages, but the difference between a cage that is a safe place and a haven and a cage that is a prison is as simple as an open door. When we're evaluating an adopter to determine what they have to offer a parrot or when we're educating an adopter to enhance what they have to offer, we need to start thinking in terms of avian environments, not just cages. A cage should not be the environment, it should be a part of the environment. And there are so many creative ways to enhance a parrot's living experience within the home. Natural branches, ropes, swings, hanging playframes can be incorporated into a setting to increase real estate and opportunities for play and exploration. A spare room or a porch or garage can be converted into dedicated bird space. We have some nice examples of things that people have done. Um, in this in this little series of photos, these are lovely examples of a spare room that's been uh, converted into dedicated bird space. And please note the middle photo that shows the screen door. It's been installed, and this is a great way to keep a bird room connected to the rest of the household. They can see in, people, you know, can see out, and um, and it's just it's this is just a wonderful, sunny, beautiful setting for birds. Uh, here, someone has converted their garage into a bird room. Notice that in this photo and in the previous photos, the cages are included in the environments, but the doors are open. You know, and birds do like to have the choice to be in the cage or out of the cage. And choice is one thing that we rob captive birds of. They so often don't have any choices. Um, let's see, the photo on the right here, um, this is large enough to be its own environment. It's a really nice cage, and we've always said, buy the biggest cage you can afford, which, you know, and um, this is a nice example. They can get pretty pricey, but um, notice that this is outfitted nicely with um, a variety of toys. Um, in the photo of the bird room on the right, it's important 
um, to note that these macaws are provided with um, the opportunity to be up high. And another well-accepted myth of parrot keeping is that parrots should be kept lower than the guardian's head. And, um, you know, parrots were born for the skies and they're oriented for height. And this um, this myth of, of keeping the parrots lower is really more about keeping them subordinate than really serving their needs. Um, here's a beautiful example of someone going the extra mile to provide outdoor space for their birds. This is a panel caging system. It's just beautiful. Um, and, and it's important to know that sunshine and fresh air um, benefit the health of parrots just as much as, as people. And um, sunshine is something that a lot of parrots um, never even see. Um, in these photos, we see how someone has used a carport frame to construct an outdoor aviary. And look how happy those macaws are. That's almost what they look like in the wild, and I've seen them in the wild. Um, so, you know, kind of to close, you know, what I have to talk about, uh, when we're talking about raising accepted, accepted standards of care for parrots, these are really the kinds of standards we need to be reaching for. Many people may not be able to achieve standards like this, but many people should not have a parrot. I don't think the idea is to make sure that everyone can find a way to have a parrot. I think the idea is to honestly evaluate what we have to offer, and if we can't meet a new standard that really serves the fundamental needs of birds in captivity, we need to rethink our choice of a pet. Cats. Cats are great pets. People should think about cats. So, Lorelai, again, I wanted um, there's a bunch of really good questions, and um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But one of them I thought was a, I wanted to address before moving on is um, um, if there's a bird, a bonded pair of birds that are destructive to one another, such as talking behaviors, should they stay together? Um, my answer to that would be. Absolutely, they're a bonded pair. I would never dream of separating them. But what needs to happen is they need to, their needs need to be addressed. There's a reason that that happens. Um, that is not a normal behavior that you see in the wild. You don't ever see birds that are plucked like that in the wild. And um, it's a behavior problem that's, that's based on one of their needs not being met, whether it's dietary, medical, space. Um, foraging, there are many, many things, and, and it's just something that a veterinarian and or a behaviorist needs to address. So uh, the answer, in my opinion, would be absolutely they need to stay together. I, I wouldn't break that pair up. I don't know if Karen or anyone else has something to add there, but I think that's important. Um, somebody else mentioned uh, also had a question about why the emphasis on Teflon toxicity. Wouldn't it be more, aren't there more deaths caused by dogs and cats hurting birds? in captivity than Teflon. I don't know the statistics. What I think is important is to, we're trying to find things. I think everybody knows that dogs and cats are probably not safe to have around birds because they're going to want to eat them. That's normal. But they probably don't all know that nonstick um, coatings are toxic to birds. So the reason we emphasize it is because it's such a different thing. It's kind of common sense. Don't put the cat and the bird together. But it's not necessarily common sense not to um, overcook your eggs in the morning. So just to clarify. Well, you know, interestingly, over the years, we have received calls from people who have um, lost their birds to other family pets. But we have received far more calls from people who are devastated to have killed their pets with Teflon. We absolutely will not um, consider adopting a bird into a home where Teflon is, is kept or used. It's our number one. I, I, I agree with that for sure. So moving on to some kind of fun things I think are important and fun are that people should, who are looking to adopt birds should be encouraged to make it enjoyable both for the birds and for themselves. For me, part of the joy of sharing my lives with these animals is being able to make them happy and give them lots to do. These are just some images of different you know, kinds of ways to get birds to forage and look for toys, look for treats, different perches and sizes of perches, different textures of things for them to chew on, um, enrichment environments outside of the bird cage so that they can really you know, 
have more things to do than, again, just sitting in a cage. These are all images of birds either with a friend or doing something more interesting than just sitting in a cage. And I think it's a, it, it should be encouraged to people and, and they should be reminded that this should be enjoyable uh, and what's enjoyable for the bird is going to be enjoyable for them as well as they're sharing their experiences together. Um, those, uh, I just like to say that those examples that we showed under environmental enhancements are things that people could actually do in an apartment because we realize if you're living in a Manhattan apartment or a condominium, you may not be able to build an aviary, but you can set up something, hang things from the ceiling or create a, a little like this one in the center with a plexiglass place stand. Um, do something in an in an apartment and still, you know, get that bird something outside the cage. Yeah, absolutely. I live in it. I'm right now at my apartment in New York City, looking at my birds, and they're all over my apartment, staring at me, and from a different <laughs> environment. And, um, and it's really it's really important to know that if you don't have to have a huge home, there are ways of um, creating environments in small spaces that are really fun um, and enjoyable for for birds. Another fabulous miss alert or alert. All <laughs> parrot needs is a bowl of seed mix and a cup of water. Well, I touched on this earlier. Uh, it's something we talk a lot about um, at my veterinary hospital. Um, these standard commercial seed-based diets are really, really deficient. There's just not enough vitamin A, calcium. There's so many nutritional elements that are missing and it's not enough to, to, to do anymore. We know better. We've, we've learned over the last several decades that we've you know, really been increasing pet bird ownership and uh, we, we should really be teaching people how to do a better job. So as a general rule, what's healthy for humans is healthy for parrots. There are very few things that we eat that they can't. Avocado is one, and certainly junk food, you know, chocolate and caffeine and things like that it, uh, shouldn't be fed to parrots, but really they're omnivorous like we are. Um, their diet should consist of no more than 10% seed. And if you are going to be feeding seeds, it should be human quality, not you know, from, a, from a pet store, but seeds. And it doesn't have to just be you know, sunflower seeds. It can be other kinds of seeds, including things like, uh, um, like, uh, well, if you go to your health food store and you go to the uh, the bins, there's a lot of wonderful different seeds and things that you can that you can get and give your birds as treats. But again, 10% is a good starting point. So what should make up the other 90%? It should be similar to people, unprocessed foods, um, un unprocessed produce, lots of green leafy vegetables, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid rich um, foods. You can uh, certainly incorporate things like nuts and walnuts and um, all things like that that are healthy for people are going to be healthy for birds. I mentioned vitamin A earlier because that's one of the vitamins that has traditionally been found to be very deficient in a seed mix diet that can cause birds a lot of problems with the respiratory tract, skin, eyes, overall health. So things that are orange and yellow, vegetables like sweet potatoes, pumpkin, yams, peppers, things like that are really important to um, enrich a bird's diet. And then, of course, we do now have commercially made um, pellets for birds. There's a lot of different brands. Uh, this is really what birds should be eating. They should have a commercially made pellet. There are, of the different varieties, there are some that, in my opinion, are better than others. I always try to find ones that are organic. And, and look at the ingredients. These days, people are looking at the ingredients of those of the processed foods they buy for themselves. So if you're gonna be feeding processed foods to your birds, including a pellet of diet, look at the ingredients in the back. Or do you want it to be completely made of soy and corn? Probably not. Um, look and see and find one that, that suits your own, um, you know, what you're choosing to feed your, feed your birds. And remember that variety definitely is the spice of life. You can cook for your birds. You can make it fun. You can, they can eat spices. They can eat seasonings. Um, it's something that I, I can't encourage enough. Again, as part of what I said before, it should be fun. People, if you want to have a bird in your life, you should also want to 
have fun cooking experiences and preparing things for your birds. It's part of what makes it enjoyable. And if, and if that doesn't make it, if you're not, if that's not something you like, you're probably not going to want to share your home with a bird or you, or you shouldn't be sharing your home with a bird. Uh, there are definitely some unique considerations to, to think about. Different, some species have different uh, requirements from, for example, large macaws uh, living in South America, the majority of their diet are these very fatty, rich uh, palm nuts and things like that, that unfortunately we, we don't have here growing in our backyard. But you might want to consider tailoring certain species diets based on the region that they're from and what their you know, physiology is meant for them to be eating by giving them, you know, I, I, my green wing macaw is probably really hard to get her a lot of the different nuts, macadamia nuts and things that are available to us um, while she's here, unfortunately, in my home. Um, reproduction and age is also an issue as far as just common sense things. If you have a bird that's laying eggs, you know, birds like chickens will lay unfertilized eggs whether or not there's a male present. So during that time, they're going to need some enhanced nutrition with calcium and protein and things like that. And elderly birds as well, like with other animals and people, you might want to watch the amount of protein that you're giving your bird um, and increase some of the other important uh, vitamins and things that as, the, as we age are more important, fatty acids and things like that. I want to talk a little about flight for birds. And, you know, I think we've mentioned earlier a few times about how important it is. And it is one of those things that needs, it's, it's another myth, I think, that, that, that birds don't need to fly. So number one, flight impairment means vulnerability. These birds use flight as a means not only of getting around, um, but it's how they escape. It's how they, you know, can retreat when they're scared. And when they're not able to do that, it really, really affects them psychologically. Um, when birds fledge, when they're uh, in the nest and they are learning to fly, it is a completely essential part of their developmental stage. Nothing is more obvious to me working in veterinary medicine than when I see a young bird who has phobic or serious self-confidence issues 99% of the time, if I do a little back research and I, I find out that they never learned to fly, they were clipped at the pet store or at the breeders before they ever learned to fly. And these birds are so frequently, they have a lot of different phobic, nervous behaviors um, that plague them throughout their life because they miss this really important um, confidence building aspect of their development. And then of course, flying is so important cardiovascularly for these birds. How else are they going to exercise? I mean, they literally become perch potatoes sitting on a perch all day if, they, if they're not able to exercise. And sure, okay, walking and climbing is okay, but most people aren't putting their birds on stairmasters in the cages. I, don't, I've never, I haven't seen that you know, invented yet. Maybe someday it will, but until then, what's a better form of exercise than flight? Well, none. There really isn't. So Everything from muscle conditioning to joint strength, um, metabolism, reproductive health. Exercising slash playing regularly. It's so, so important um, medically and behaviorally. Uh, myth alert. Depriving a bird from flight doesn't matter to the bird and keeps them safe. This is one I've heard many, many times over the years. Um, I don't know that we can say what does or doesn't matter to a bird. I don't know what would make us think it wouldn't matter to a bird. They were designed by nature. All of a sudden, you're taking that ability away from them. I don't know why one would assume that wouldn't matter to them, but okay. And keeping them safe, I, I honestly believe it's quite the opposite of that. Um, it's a fundamental function, and as I mentioned before, physically and psychologically, it's really, really important. Coraline? Yeah. Yes? Hello? Somebody just, somebody just said my name. Loreline, we can't hear you. I don't know. I haven't yeah, seen you on the call. Can you hear me now? I can. I can hear, I can hear Lorelai. I can hear her. Okay, then maybe it's just me. 
I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to continue talking. If, maybe if okay. people aren't can't hear me, post something. Um, I haven't changed yeah. anything. Okay, I can hear you now. You sound better then. You were breaking up, but I think, you know, maybe talk more directly into the microphone. <laughs> I don't know, maybe something happened. A parrot was drowning me out. <laughs> Gosh, that <laughs> <it> wasn't <laughs> They're being really good right now. Okay. Um, I'll hold it up a little. I hope this is better. Sorry, guys. So okay. what I was talking about was was more about flight and how important it is um, for their, as a fundamental function, both physically and uh, psychologically for them. So a lot of times people come to us at the veterinary hospital and they, and they want their bird's wings clipped. And the first thing I always ask them is, why? Why do you want your bird's wings clipped? And they say, oh, well, because, uh, you know, I was just told that that's what we need. It's, so they bond with me better. Well, okay, I, I guess in some instances I see why they, they recommend that, especially if you have a, you know, a little parakeet that is terrified and, and isn't used to being out near people. Sure, if you take its ability to get away from you away and you force to you know stick it on your hand, that may be quote bonding. But you know, in my opinion, that is not the way that you're going to um, endear your your pet to you by forcing them to be with you when they're absolutely horrified and terrified. We know better now. There are better ways of bonding with your pet bird um, or Maybe you shouldn't bond with your pet bird. Um, think outside the box, and I tell this to clients all the time. I don't, I, I, I don't put it delicately. I just tell it like it is. If your bird, and if you don't have the time or ability to do what's needed to bond with your bird properly, because that can be a long process, then maybe your bird just needs another bird to be naturally bonded to. And I start introducing that an idea as, as a way that might be more appropriate for them. And then safety is the other thing they say, well, oh, I just wanted to be safe because I have a dog or a cat and I, I just, I don't want them to, you know, fly into the dog's mouth or something. I, I hear things like this all the time or, you know, I don't want the bird flying out the window. Well, I, again, it, it seems ridiculous to me. If you don't want the bird flying out the window, close the window, get a screen. Um, and it's quite the opposite if there's other predatory animals in the home, flipping the bird's wings will make them way more vulnerable. Um, you want to have the bird able to escape. You want that bird to be an expert flyer so that they can be completely away from these animals. You know, in the wild, that's what their wings are for, evading problems, getting away from problems. So, sure, there are, I have seen, I've seen every, you know, worst case scenario, and I am going to talk about some of the dangers in the home again, um, where birds fly into trouble. Um, but more often than not, if you keep the the potential hazards away, flight is, the, the risks far outweigh, or the benefits far outweigh the risks um, of, of you know, keeping your birds able to fly. <clears throat> Looks like you guys can hear me better now, so it's good. Um, so, adopter education moving forward and outdoor safety is, uh, again, really important Thing that we talk about. The birds do enjoy and benefit from sunshine and fresh air. However, taking safety measures to prevent escape and taking them outside is essential. So, you know, UV light from the sun, we're finding this to be more and more important for birds' uh, medical health, um, both for calcium absorption as well as their psychological well-being. Um, direct sunlight is uh, really, really crucial for them. And of course, fresh air is as well. Any time that you're uh, in, you know, kept in a home, you know, we go stir crazy when we're kept inside. I think a lot of that has to do with with air quality, and you just want fresh air. So getting your birds outside can be enormously beneficial, but you've got to be safe about it. Um, Screened-in porches are wonderful. There were some great pictures that Karen was showing you earlier of ways to um, have your birds access to outside safely. If you bring your bird outside, and again, this is my opinion and our stance, is to always have your bird in a carrier or travel cage. It can be a carrier or travel cage that is made of mesh or wire or metal um, so that they can get the benefits of the fresh air and UV light. It doesn't have to just be a cardboard box or a big plastic box where they actually can't see or anything like that. I, I love when I see people in New York City 
with their parrots outside, basically in a cage, a small carrying cage outside. It's really great to, be, to see people doing that for their birds. They do make harnesses for birds, um, both, mostly the larger sized ones, and I, I think these can be great. The problem is it's, it's a lot of times birds don't tolerate it very well. It's hard getting your bird um, in them. They are able to take them off. Um, so having a situation where you might need to train your bird to be able to have a harness on it might be a, a way to start. I wouldn't just towel your bird, you know, throw a force a harness on it and bring it outside. You want to know how they're going to react to it before, and that can be a little bit complicated, but certainly that is a way of getting them outside. And then there's the free flying issue. Um, there, there are a lot of advocates out there for people who free fly their birds. I've known clients of ours who do it. There's obvious safety issues there. Um, I have seen the people who train their birds and our you know, formal bird trainers who take their birds outside and have for years and years and free fly them. And then for whatever reason, a windy day, maybe it's a seasonal thing, the bird's a little bit more territorial or what, who knows what's going on in the bird's mind on that day, but they, they lose them and um, it's, it's crushing. So it, it, it's not something that I would even remotely ever recommend to anyone, no matter their level of expertise. Of course, there's legal issues as well. Um, releasing non-native species is illegal. None of these birds are native um, anywhere in the United States that, that I'm aware of. Um, and as far as that's left to professionals, sure, there are some um, zoological parks that have professional bird trainers. And it is glorious to see these birds um, free flying and on command and, and all of that. You know. As far as your own personal ethical beliefs with it, as far as training birds, I'll leave that up to you. Um, but as far as our recommendations and what I think you guys should be recommending to potential adopters is don't do it. It's, it's way too complicated, too many dangers, and I would strongly recommend um, not doing that. Somebody mentioned, speaking of the illegality of releasing non-natives, why is pigeon racing legal, or is it? I'm not really sure about that. That's a really good question. I have to do a little research on that because certainly pigeon racing and people keep pigeons who are um, non technically non non native all over New York City. It's quite popular. People love it as a sport, um, and I don't see those people getting arrested. So I don't know. It's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, aware of that. <clears throat> So on to some safety matters. Flighted birds are especially prone to these potential hazards in the home. So again, I do think birds should be able to fly, but they should, people should just be made aware. And I unfortunately have seen pretty much all of these birds that um, have a collision with ceiling fans, wood burning fireplaces, or any other open flames. Again, it's not just the smoke or the toxins we worry about, but it's also that they, if birds are attracted to sparkly, shiny things, um, and they might just be curious enough to fly into something like this. Um, doors that are open, even just glass windows. Uh, I've seen, obviously, birds we all know fly into windows, unfortunately, um, tends to be the wild birds that fly into windows of buildings and things, but it's, it is a really big problem uh, for mirrors as well. And then any kind of an open tub of water, a flushing toilet, again, it's swirling around, it's making a fun noise, birds might want to see what's happening in there. Um, I have seen birds that have been severely injured from flying into, you know, soups on the stove or even um, a thing, a steaming uh, coffee ground. I saw a parakeet once get severely injured and burned from, it just thought it was really cool looking and maybe it was a nest because it was like brown and smoking, I don't know, he flew right into it, and that was that was a big problem. So, um, I, you know, you just have to be careful and aware of these dangers. They're, they seem like common sense, but again, a listing of them on an on adoption page might be a good idea. And then you can just keep, keep birds safe by preventing these um, issues in the home. So population control is obviously really important. Um, in the event that a bonded pair of birds begins nesting, um, you know, and they're in your shelter program, you know, how do you, how do you handle that? Um, it's, it is seasonal, although 
there are some birds who kind of do this year round. Certain species of birds are just more likely to lay eggs and nest kind of all year, regardless of what their natural season may be. Certainly, doves and pigeons are very, very prolific. Parakeets, cockatiels, birds like that kind of can go all year round if you're not careful. Um, some ways to eliminate this are to to get rid of places they like to lay eggs. They, I mean, I have seen birds really go crazy anywhere. Cardboard boxes are a particular, particularly fun place for birds to make nests. They sell those little, I think they call them happy huts, little cozy things for birds. And it's really cute when a bird goes into these little fuzzy houses, but a lot of times they interpret this as a nest. Um, remember that the vast majority of parrots in the wild don't sleep in, in a nest. They go in there to create, um, to create babies. They only do that when they're in the breeding season. They don't generally build a nest um, and then go in there every night to sleep. So I think it's important to realize that when, when people give your, when you give your bird what you think is just a little place for it to sleep, they could interpret that as a, a place to build a nest. Um, they definitely perceive their cages as their territory. Sometimes they even perceive that as a nest itself, and they'll just start building things within the cage, um, which, again, can be really fun and cute to watch, but just be aware that, that that nesting behavior might turn into actual egg laying. Um, and it is a conversation to have with potential um, pet owners as well that by excessive stim excessively stimulating them can kind of throw them into egg laying cycles. Certain birds like cockatoos, they want to be held and petted and scratched. And I don't think what people realize if they're not, you know, well-versed in bird behavior is that that's all that alloprening and the face scratching and the kissing and the rubbing and the touching. It's, it's interpreted by the bird as sexual behavior. Um, and that can really stimulate them to start uh, creating a, a little family. So in the event that that does happen, we encourage our clients to pull and replace the eggs. Obviously, we don't want them to be breeding and making more and more babies. So once you see an egg has been produced, rather than removing it completely, we recommend that you replace it with a fake egg or um, you can take the egg and some people have a problem with this, but you can put it in the freezer, you can boil it and then give it back, whatever you're comfortable with. But the reason we put them back is because if you don't, the bird will just generally keep laying and laying. It's in their, they, they want to, you know, they're programmed to reproduce, they're wild animals and they're just going to keep laying eggs if they don't think they're there. You want to let them have the eggs for the full extent of their gestation, which can vary by species. It tends to be, usually be about three weeks for the average bird. Um, you want to leave fake eggs or eggs that have been um, you know, damaged so that they're not fertile uh, in, in the nest for about three weeks, depending on the species. And of course, educating your uh, potential adopters about reproductive disease and chronic problems is important. That in and of itself could be a very long lecture we're not going to go into, but um, reproductive diseases uh, can include uh, what we call egg binding. I think that might be the most common one to make people aware of, that especially if their nutrition isn't good, especially if they don't have access to full spectrum or um, sunlight they are susceptible to not being able to lay eggs normally and they can actually get stuck inside of them and cause a serious medical emergency or death. Um, and of course they get cancers and polyps and cysts and all things that other animals get reproductively and, and people should be aware that that can happen and the more we encourage them to become reproductively active, the more you're gonna see a lot of these problems. Um, uh, somebody just mentioned on the comments here that except Quakers who do roost. As far as I know, that's the only one that, um, that does uh, nest year round. Um, they build these huge communities and they will sleep in their nests um, without thinking of it as reproductive time. And that's actually why sometimes Quaker parrots are one of the most cage territorial parrots I've ever met uh, because they, they really do think of it as their nest slash sleeping habitat slash territory and, and you better not go near it or they're going to rip your arm off. Um, once they're away from their nest, they're perfectly lovely creatures, but when they're near that cage or nest, sometimes they're, they're quite vicious. So, Karen, you're next. I'm or, next. Or, no, I think Kelly. 
Yeah, it's me, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> um, so, well, I just want to, you know, I'm going to wrap this up for the most part, but I want to really thank Karen and Lorelai for all the really amazing information um, that they've provided so far. And, you know, for the majority of it, we've been talking about the steps and information that would benefit the birds and their new caregivers in providing them with the best welfare possible. But I'm sure we all have experience where adoption may not always be the, the, the only way to go. So some of you may not have avian adoption programs at your shelters, or you find that you know, you're know you at capacity for space and you can't really take on a, a new group of animals uh, at all, including birds. Or that you know you you do the assessment and you find out that the bird just isn't really a good candidate for home placement. So you know what I wanted to you know bring up again, I mentioned it earlier that we need to set up some alternative options and do this ahead of time. So you don't want to end up with you know ten birds coming in your facility and then not having the communication with the right organizations that could help you with the placement. So this is, you know, getting back to developing partnerships and building relationships with other organizations in support of the welfare of any birds that might come into your facility. And so, you know, as this was one of our main objectives um, for GFAS in coming up with this, um, this webinar series, we want to really support the development of these connections. And really, most importantly, making those connections with organizations that have a comparable standard of high um, quality of care. And at the core of this, we get back to those five freedoms. So we want to ensure the birds have the capacity to live the rest of their lives with these guiding principles in mind. So GFAS has done a lot of thinking about how to ensure the animals in captivity are well provided for, not only from the direct care perspective, but you know, just as important to us is that the actual organization is healthy as well. One that can provide a sustainable and uh, is available for the lifetime of the care for that animal, even if the lifetime is expected to be decades. So you know, we include safety, financial management, and governance standards as well. And for those sanctuaries and rescues that go through our accreditation process, we ensure these freedoms by setting guidelines for the housing requirements, such as space guidelines, physical facilities, nutritional requirements, and the like, and making sure that their social needs um, are, are considered as well. But again, to emphasize some of the discussion that's already taken place, um, we want to make sure that the animals that enter into these captive environments are not um, being allowed to breed. And the GFAS standard um, says that you know, we don't really believe that any animal should end up in a captive environment. Um, so unless it's part of a formal reintroduction program that would you know, invest animals into their native habitat, um, you know, we would restrict um, any kind of breeding. So, when you're looking for placement partners, of course, you know, we recommend our own accredited organizations first. And I would, you know, highly recommend reaching out to those that might be in your area. However, you know, there's only so many that have gone through the rigorous application process um, to become a GFAS accredited sanctuary. And so it's, a, it's prudent to expand upon um, your network to other facilities um, that might, you know, be able to facilitate your your placement needs. So some possible examples include, you know, parrot rescue sanctuary and placement uh, clubs, veterinarians and and clinics, uh, bird club adoption programs, animal shelters, humane societies, um, foster homes, and animal boarding facilities. Um, some of these might be short term support. So something like the, the foster homes and animal boarding, so that's going to fulfill needs that, you know, if you're, if you're at a short-term space restriction, this might help you get to a point where you can still um, support the needs of the animals, but, um, you know, ultimately make, you know, get them back to your own facilities. Then others are going to be more um, supportive for the long-term. 
And, you know, those, again, are going to be the sanctuaries, but, you know, looking at a potential adoption program. And it's these that, you know, are then the long-term care that, you know, is, is really super critical that you start developing because, you know, it is, it's going to be a, a significant undertaking on, you know, the, the part of your partner if you go to them for support in, you know, helping get these animals adopted or placed. But uh, given that, you know, we want to be careful about who we're reaching out to. And so, um, you know, we want to, again, ensure that we're all following the same guidelines of care, ensuring the five freedoms. And so there's, you know, a, a couple warning signs that I'm going to have here. But, you know, in general, you want to be smart about um, and, and diligent when you're selecting your partners. So for one, um, you know, you want to look at the history of the organization, and you know one one aspect is um, what is their reputation for selling birds, not the adoption, but for profit. Um, specifically, parrots have a perceived value of um, you know that facilities might become interested in taking them off your hand, um, so that they might be able to sell them in order to to make a profit. And obviously, that's a big no no. So ask them about their adoption program. What criteria for adopters do they have? You know, what kind of fee structure do they put in? Uh, what is a contingency plan if an adoption does not work out? You know, recommendations for long-term um, care if, you know, once the original owner passes away and those things that, you know, we've talked about already. Um, another issue, again, is breeding. And, you know, we want to make sure that we're not uh, emphasizing a problem by allowing um, breeding to, to continue. So, um, you know, just like dogs and cats. So we want to be diligent, diligent when we're creating these par partners, looking for, again, suspicious activity. Are they known for selling birds um, or giving birds away to potential breeders? Do they actually sell animals to fund their operations? Are they the type that are just collecting birds and letting them breed due to to a lack of diligence in some of the, the options that Laurel I was just talking about population control. So these are all the kind of things that, you know, when you're creating partnerships, although very, very important, you know, you want to make sure that you're following along the same philosophical guidelines that you've established as, you know, an organization yourself. And of course, GFAS is here to be a reference for you. Uh, there's a few things I want to point out that exist on our website, sanctuaryfederation.org. Um, first of all, we have a list of all of our accredited sanctuaries. Some of them are specifically avian, but I also wanna point out that, that we have a lot of different groups that have multi-species um, that they care for, which would then also include avian species. So go see if there's any in your area and uh, introduce yourself. Not only are they potentially good for placement, but, you know, they're going to, like, you know, obviously Karen's been this amazing wealth of information. They might just be able to be someone if you have that relationship to go to when you just need some advice. Um, of course, we also have our standards of care. Um, we actually have four different groups of birds that have individual standards for their needs. Birds of prey, aquatic birds, arboreal perching birds, and ground feeding birds. Then uh, another objective of us having this, um, and I apologize if the dog is snoring. I tried to move and she followed me. Um, so the last thing I want to say is, um, you know, we obviously want to make sure that um, if you are a rescue organization, we highly recommend you going through our accreditation process. Um, you know, some of the basic criteria, you know, if you're wondering if, um, your organization qualifies, some of the, the issues that, you know, we look first to is, are you a 501c3 organization or, you know, some other government, if you don't, if you're not based in the U.S., uh, other governmentally recognized nonprofit status. Um, again, you have a no breeding policy, except in the cases of reintroduction of native species. Um, you demonstrate ethical acquisition and disposition of your animals, again, kind of discouraging the buying and selling and the pet trade of, of these uh, animals. And then, you know, again, con direct contact is, is really based on the needs of the animal. 
I want to discourage things that um, would be potentially harmful. But you know, if an animal is um, it does provide a social benefit, then you know we'll certainly can encourage that. So with with that little spiel, um, I just want to hand it back to Denise. And before I do that, um, I want to really give all of the speakers um, that were part of this three-part series a very warm thank you, um, Lorelai and Karen today, um, Dr. Anthony Tolney from the first. Uh, presentation and then of course I'd, I want to support um, give a thank you for uh, to Denise for really being the the cheerleader and organizer for this um, what I hope is a lot of, uh, amazing resource for us all yes. I'm gonna let, thank you. Um, Very much. That, let Denise give us our the final word um, the final word is that mm -hmm. the parrots need you um, Birds that are in the shelters are really suffering a major upheaval of their lives, and we need to be there for them. And sometimes it just takes observation and time on the part of the shelter to determine what's best for these birds. Um, some, you know, we talk about adoptable, unadoptable. I think time and observation leads you to make the right choice. And I'm so appreciative that everyone um, contributed to this and for everyone who's attended, um, please share all of the three webinar links with any of your colleagues that are um, caring for birds. And um, those of you who are doing avian work, um, please investigate uh, becoming an accredited facility. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Denise. Um, and did you have one more slide you wanted to at least pull up while we do any final comments? Well, Perfect. It's just, uh, yes, just our disclaimer. Um, we want to make sure that everyone uses this information to the best of their informed discretion to evaluate what is appropriate for their particular situation. And thank you very much, everyone. And um, any last words, Kelly? I will jump in and I will mention that um, I know we got some questions. I don't think we got to all of them. Thank you all so much for your questions. We're kind of over time at this point, so unless any of the presenters saw any questions they want to make sure to touch on right now, Denise will make sure and she'll go through the chat and we'll pass right. along any questions that weren't responded to and we'll get your response via email. So Yes, we will we'll, we will do that. Right. Please keep that in mind. So. Uh, I don't. If, if anybody has any closing comments they want to make, I just want to again reiterate what Kelly said. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to all of the presenters and to Denise. You all did a great job in, in getting such very nice comments in the chat. So thank you all Robin, very much. Robin, you're being too um, modest. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. If it wasn't for Robin, I would have. Ah, <laughs> it was fantastic working with you. <laughs> Not a um, problem. Not a problem. And and I would, if anybody has, I'm sorry. I I just I feel compelled to just um, very quickly address Elizabeth Elizabeth um, Young, who is um, so concerned about pigeons and and doves. And um, we we have actually um, at our sanctuary taken in um, quite a lot of these. Um, sometimes they come in the form of um, they're they're actually wild pigeons who. Um, we um, have actually re-released them because they they came from the wild. Um, we evaluate them, and um, sometimes they're not eligible for release, and we do keep a little mixed aviary, and we've got some pigeons, pigeons and doves. But we've gotten to know some pigeons, and they're absolutely fabulous animals, and um, they are social and intelligent and funny and crazy, and um, and so <laughs> people underestimate these these animals they're they're awesome and they they deserve our consideration as well. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> I agree. Are, any other comments, Kelly or Lorelai or Karen or Denise, before we end the presentation? I don't think so. I think I think we're good. But again, a warm thank you to everybody involved and. Um, I think I think this is a really valuable thing that we'll 
to be available for a long time so that people will be able to continue to reference it. So you'll be able to Great. find it on our website um, for a long time. And thank you, Kelly. We will get, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, in the next couple of days, we'll send out a survey and a link to this recording as soon as it's up and ready. So thank you again, everybody, for attending and for your time today. Okay. Thank well, what you. Good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.